give me like a quick thumbs up if you if we are. Um, where would I check? Um, probably just on YouTube. But yeah, I think that we should be live now. So let's let's just jump in here. Um, it says we're it says we're live. So hey everybody, so this is our uh, second. I can hear what you're saying, by the way. Or. Why am I hearing myself? You probably have the tab open, the YouTube stream open somewhere. Oh, I'm so crazy. Okay, sorry guys, no, that was bad. Okay, so now let's really start. <laughs> so hey everybody, this is our second uh, town hall live stream and we have a special guest today, June Park. Um, he's you know an author of the Generative Agents paper. That paper was really inspirational to a lot of people and you know I, I personally learned a lot from it. So yeah, thanks for joining us today, June. I think. The plan is we're going to, you know, run through the alpha game together, talk about kind of our thinking around it. And then after that, it would be great to, you know, dive deeper into the generative agents paper um, and then learn more about what you're working on these days and how it might apply to gaming. I think that's really for the people who are joining in. There's a lot of people interested in the intersection of AI and gaming. So maybe to kick things off, can you maybe give us a, a quick intro? Tell us a little bit about yourself and the goals of your work. Yeah, for sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, excited to be here. Yeah, so my name is June Park. I'm a PhD student at Stanford's Computer Science Department. Um, and I work sort of at the intersection of what we call human-computer interaction and natural language processing. But more specifically, within that intersection, what I'm really intrigued by is this idea of simulation, in particular, simulation of human behavior. So I wrote this paper, as Andrew mentioned, called Generative Agents, which was if you play Sims, basically. Imagine Sims, but all the characters are now powered by Flores Lynch model and a, a basically an agent architecture that we proposed, which gives the Flores Lynch model an ability to maintain a long-term memory and short-term memory based on that and do some reflections to create actions and reactions. Um, and sort of the main use cases uh, for that particular project in the early days that we're seeing today is certainly around gaming. So obviously with games, there's a lot of NPCs that we need to create. Can these NPCs not just be hardwired in the back, but also react dynamically and create their own storyline or dialogues with the users and even for relationships uh, with the user. So that's the space that I've been in. Um, but really, more broadly, it is about this idea, again, of simulating human behavior and what new forms of interaction we can create with them. Nice. And yeah, we've definitely been thinking, like, read the paper and have been thinking about this within the context of gaming. And I think a, a lot of developers definitely found your, your work inspiring. And, you know, we, especially Dan, have been thinking a lot about simulation games over the last decade. And in particular, how to create like the next generation of you know emergent narrative games, and you know I think tools such as language models or large language models are going to be you know really important to kind of create these next genre defining experiences. And so yeah, we've been working on our, our platform for about six months, and recently you know released a productized experience of our tooling called Can You Survive a Night with a Vampire? Might be good if we kind of kick things off with you know maybe go through a playthrough or two um, of it with you. And, and you, we can kind of speak more broadly about you know your work and what what we're doing and within the context of this this stream. So um, if you can click on the present your screen and while you work that out, Dan, do you want to add any kind of like intros to what we're going to be streaming here? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, like Andrew said, I mean, really the thing that we're we're really interested in. in uh, um, you know, experimenting with is is this idea of emergent narrative. Um, there's lots of different types of emergent gameplay that that the games industry has been able to um, bring forth, um, but not necessarily like narrative in in the true sense of the word, where you can, as a player, control your your destiny, where your story takes you, um, outside of something like uh, you know MMOs or something like that. What's what's uh, something that's more of a, an experience you can have without all the baggage of of uh, you know, it, uh, and the toxicity of, of a social game like like MMOs. Um, so there is we we live at the intersection between simulation and uh, language models uh, to make this happen. And we're doing a lot of uh, different experiments. But not only do we want to make a fun experience with it, we also want to be able to let anybody create these kinds of experiences as well. 
Um, so that what we are about to see, this vampire game, Can You Survive a Night with a Vampire, is just one proof of concept uh, demonstrating uh, what we're able to do with our tool set. And uh, we can talk more about where we want to take it into the future as well. Totally. Yeah, so June, if you press the full screen button, I think there's a teal button at the upper right. I'll add your. I'll add it to the stage when, once I see it go full. Okay, so right. yeah, we should. Okay, we should be full screen. If you, you don't, you can minimize the, the stream yard. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. How about this? Um, cool. Awesome. So yeah, let's uh, to set the stage. You've you know found yourself in in the bedroom of, of a young lady, and you find out, oh no, she's a vampire, and now you have to convince right. her to not suck your blood. So if you click anywhere, that'll begin. And so yeah, just just click anywhere, and. We might want to mute it actually also um, if you press the mute button there. Okay. Maybe it is muted. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you can click to move around. Um, and then let's click on any item. For example, maybe click on that knife there. Um, and you can talk about the knife. Let's see. What? Oh, if you, if you click on ask. Oh, if you just click on ask about the knife. This this is uh, just to kind of like keep it a leader. So creepy knife, what's it for? Oh, this little thing, it's just for cutting, like totally non people stuff, babe. For real though, don't sweat it. So she's already telling you, don't worry, this knife is not for cutting people. But I don't really trust her. So we've kind of added in some basic stuff that you can click on just for usability. But you can also use free text. And I think that's where you were gonna go. So yeah, feel free to type in wh whatever you want. And again, your your goal is to convince her, you know, to not suck your blood. And you have on the right here, you have the bloodlust score. So that's how hungry she is. And then you have uh -oh. your relationship score. Got it. So, so uh, is the goal, that. so do I want to maximize the relationship score while lowering the blood uh, loss? Is that the idea? Dan, well, that's your goal, the... right? <laughs> I mean, you could choose whatever ending you want here, but if you want to like mm. uh, survive the night, uh, things are easier when she likes you, right? So a part of this game, and the, one of the reasons why we put it in a context of a room rather than just a chat bot that's purely text-based is that uh -huh. we want to integrate more of the environment in the gameplay. So you can actually investigate things in the room to learn about her and the things that she likes and use that to your advantage to build your relationship with her. Right, okay. Just out of curiosity then, let's start with... Okay, what if I ask, tell me about what you got for lunch <laughs> today? Uh, I just, I wonder if vampires have lunch. Are they even awake at that hour? <laughs> yeah, lunch, I mean, lunch for them might be like now, actually, 2, 2 a.m. Oh, honey, you're looking at it. Oh, you're looking at it. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Um, a smoothie hmm. with a special kind of iron supplement, you know? So good for the skin. I see. <laughs> Okay. Do so you say, oh, God, I'm thirsty. Oh, shit, that's blood. Calm down, babe. It's not decent, but a girl's got to have her fix, you know? Want to sip? Just kidding. Or not. And so this is one of the things that we just love to do with, like, I know generative agents was mostly exploring behavior, but one of the things that we love right. exploring in our experiences is voice, you know, because everybody can have such unique voices. In this case, you know, she's got this kind of quirky uh, valley girl sort of personality to her that really leads to interesting dialogue. Fascinating. Okay. Uh, so your relationship is still low. You might want to, if you're trying to survive, if you're, <laughs> you might want to figure out how, how do you can get it to like you better. I see. Uh, let's, let's change the conversation a little. What is your, can you believe this variety of Victorian style chair? It's necessary. Oh, she's complaining that. about the style of her house. I don't think I like this style either. I don't. I don't think I really like this style either. What do you like? What style do you like? Maybe. So let's find out what's her what's her vibe. What's her style? Yeah, I've had some fun, like really pushing the system and trying to like, you know, like I asked her for a while, like what, what color is my hat, you know, 
um, right. and was like learning about like the limitations, but now she knows. Um, that was just bad setup on my side. Totally, babe. I'm all about that modern golf style. I missed it here. If you press the um, there's a button on the on the upper left side, the little message um, uh -huh. icon there. It'll show the comment. There you go. Nice. You can so drag. She's all about the that. There. Yeah. Uh oh. Uh -oh. Chasing uh -oh. after you. Oh, wait. That's <laughs> um, uh, socializing is not my particularly strong suit here. Uh, okay, let's see. <laughs> oh there. Okay, let's let's change the conversation a little bit. Uh, okay, and you okay, can you can that. hit her with typos. It's okay. Okay, what kind of music do you like? Something, anything to make her not think about food. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh oh, you know, it, does she like games? Is that is that a game? Yeah, that is. Okay, maybe I should have asked about. Oh no. Uh, I mean, to get things started, you could click on it and inspect panic. it. Um, I see. How do you know music is my jam, babe? I'm super into Panic at the Disco and My Chemical Romance. Wow, Dan, you must have uh, infused your I, musical tastes into her. Yeah, I think um, I think I have. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's kind of part of the game plan. Is we sprinkled in like her backstory, and so by like looking at the uh, computer, you find out oh she's into streaming. She did fashion, and she also likes games. Um, and you can start to see now there, there's an effect where there, there's starting to be a red pulse, and that's like her bloodlust is getting stronger. Um, right. So you're running lower and lower on time, but you only if you can survive for four more minutes, you will, oh, and you, you'll make oh. it. And you can see there she uh, she liked what you said, and then you saw those hearts, so that improved your relationship. And that's, that's like. Answer. And that's part of the uh, the what we have now, and actually this is gonna be important going forward, is the emotion uh -huh. engine. So right now the emotions are pretty simple. It's like right. if, if she likes it or dislikes it, she'll emote hearts or emote like angry vibes, emotes. Um, and we're, what we're gonna be doing in the future for like the, the next step is it's actually gonna have a much more varied emotional uh, response. Because we right. really believe like emotion is, oops, and it looks like, <laughs> She got you. <laughs> <sighs> One of the fun I things see. that we do is we give a custom game over message based on their their play history as well. Um, I can't read that too well. Um, let's see. see. As Madison nice. the vampire fed on him, he began to lose consciousness, draped in darkness and unable to resist. He succumbed to the inevitable. His last thoughts were uh, a fading vision of a neon sign flickering in the darkness of Madison's room. So like even the game over screen is contextually aware of their environment. There is like a neon, uh, you know, sign in the background uh, above her, her gaming rig. Um, but yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. So um, you can, you can press refresh. I think, you know, what would be interesting is not really yeah. just also you trying to beat it. That's that's whatever. Anybody can do that. But I'd be curious to see you probe the system. Well, any like like if you were trying to do like a psychological analysis of, of this or trying to understand it, like what would be I'd be curious to, to see what where what line of questioning you might want to take it. So when, if when anything comes that, to mind. When you say that and trying to understand sort of the architecture of the system, is that sort of where you're going with this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's because we have we've got people who come on and stream who they're like gamers and they can right. even they have trouble beating it but they can, they can figure it out but I'm curious from you from a researcher side like um what what would be places you would want to push you can press refresh yeah right there um okay not to put you on the spot or anything so if you, nothing comes to mind that's fine just the we could just simply start and see how much this bleeds in Can you give me a list of things that you want to talk about? Interesting. Yeah. Good approach. This is interesting. <laughs> Just ask her directly, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Let's see. Yeah, we've uh, I've I've tried to convince her she's in the matrix, and that doesn't bother her. 
I like talking about streaming days, miss my followers. Let's see here. Oh, and then she mentions her friend that she accidentally killed Jessica. Um, let's spill tea. Do you have any epic fails like that? So she's, she's given you two, two pretty important parts of her psychological profile, her love of streaming and her, her killing her best friend. Right. Okay, then what if, what if I actually bring in uh, something like uh, uh, epic fail? A bunch of, of, I, one kind. And she really wants you to, she's asking you more about what do you regret? She's really curious about that. <laughs> Being in this room right now <laughs> with, with a vampire. Uh, one time I was in a room with a vampire and she wanted to drink my blood. Crazy, right? What do you think? Let's see. Let's see what that does. You have a little bit of a relationship with her now, so you might survive that okay. potential insult. Oh. Uh oh. oh. Nope. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so why did you, um, if you can, if you scroll, you can, I want to see what she said. Um, yeah, note to self, don't insult a vampire when you don't have a relationship. Yeah, do not do uh, let's see. <clears throat> Does it only work uh, during the game? Let's see. Oh, you keep keep scrolling. It'll uh, it keeps you can go through ah, the there you go. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah. So, why are you trying to fight it, babe? I mean, isn't attorney with me so tempting? I could even show you my absolutely adorbs coffin bed. <laughs> yeah. So. Interesting. Okay, hot dogs. Yeah. Hot dogs. How did that slip in there? Um, yeah. So in this, this is um, there, there's still a little bit of polish here, but um, yeah, th this is great because this really lets us like go through the whole conversation history and like it's great for debugging because we can pull up like what happened and kind of analyze it when we see things that we like or don't like. And one thing I'm excited about is we're going to be adding like a thumbs up, thumbs down for all these so that we can start to let you know have people rating the the quality of the conversation so that um we can better qa but then also someday train you know fine tune train our models which is going to be great um but yeah, yeah that, but that was before, great so yep before this call you know we were chatting a little bit and one of the things i just think is just interesting because you were mentioning what uh you know what your focus was with generative agents was believability, having believable agents. And now your your next focus is, is uh, I forget how you phrased it. You, you said something about uh, having them accurate, I guess, to a simulation. That's right. Now, th that's exactly the thing that we're super interested in um, because we want not just a play experience that is, um, you know, that looks on the surface like it's, 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 uh, resembles like a, an immersion narrative, but something that's truly meaningful and is true to the world that you're playing in and things have, uh, you know, cause and effect and, and significance in that way. So I'm just kind of curious, you know, your thoughts about that topic in general and, and, you know, uh, having played what, uh, you know, our, our, our demo for the first time, you know, just what are your thoughts, I guess, in general? Right. So, right, as you mentioned, so I'm now getting deeply interested in this idea of accuracy. Uh, so do the things that happen in the simulation, can they replicate in the real world? Um, and I do, so I just think come a little bit more from, when I say accuracy, a little bit more from the scientific angle as well. So imagine if you're a social scientist or a policymaker and you want to ask, how would my new policy pan out or how my, let's say my, social science theories actually get validated in the real world, that's a really difficult question to ask sometimes because with humans, you cannot really ask these kind of factual questions, right? Even in this game, what we've done uh, from the first to you know, the first try and the second try was, okay, this likely killed me, so I'll try something else, right? And that killed me, okay, so maybe I won't do that. So we gradually learn as we try and ask these kind of factual questions. But in human society, we do not have the ability to do that. So if we can create accurate simulations of human behavior, you can imagine basically spinning up multiple experiments where we start to ask these questions. Right? So we try to set up this policy, whether it's economics or political science or what have you, 
and see what happens uh, with the population. And if it sort of moves in the direction that you want them to, then that's great. Then you can continue to push on that. And if it doesn't, like like here where I'm now dead twice, uh, you can try to go the other direction and try to set up new interventions. Uh, you can imagine this getting uh, used in the context of certainly, like, as I mentioned, policy decision making, uh, social science. If you're a psychologist, social scientist, that will be useful. But you can also imagine this getting used by, let's say, online communities um, who need to set up the norms and standards within their communities, set up policies or moderation strategies. Then that's also a venue that could be potentially interesting. And even education, right, uh, where we need to train people, I guess, in some instance, maybe to social, uh, have them talk during a, manage hard conversations or difficult conversations. I guess like here, where I'm trying to convince a vampire not to uh, drink my blood, but also in, let's say, a job interview or other kind of tough spot that people might be in, can we create accurate simulations of those scenarios so that people can come in and exercise their social networking skills or ability to communicate and then go on to their real life and actually try that out. So those are some of the things that I'm thinking about today. Yeah, well, and one of the things that you just mentioned is something we've definitely heard from people already, which is they're like, oh, this is cool. It'd be cool if I could like, you know, practice, you know, a job interview in the game itself, or could I, you know, practice some sort of educational thing, like practicing my English, you know, in it, um, or, hey, I, you know, this could be helpful for me to learn social situations. like. By talking with Madison, I feel like I know how to talk to people better. Um, right. And that's kind of an interesting thing, right? Like traditionally in games, it's like a, a fantasy in that, you know, in games traditionally, you use game mechanics to do things you couldn't do in real life. Like in, you know, the, the most recent Zelda games, you jump off a cliff and fly on a hang glider. And then you try to see what can I do with this? And now we have a way to conversationally do like do things that we wouldn't be comfortable doing in real life. So. I think there's some really interesting, you know, use cases here for 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 this whole where the whole place is going. And a question I have for yeah. you actually is because um, you mentioned it, I think, before the call, but I'd be great to hear more about this with the uh, about the evaluation side of the um, Smallville simulation, mm -hmm. right? Like I have a, a screenshot here. So this this was the town a brief high level snapshot. And this was the the evaluation side of it. And you'd mentioned that it kind of had passed the Turing test. So can you talk a little bit more about how you guys evaluated and what were your kind of takeaways from that? Right. Oh, so let me briefly stop that. I can, if we need to, I can stop. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, again, you can but... stop the stream. Yeah, yeah, stop it. Cool. Yeah. So this is, so let's see. So this is the evaluation of Smallville. And again, with Smallville, what we really wanted to show was this idea of believability that you know, do these agents sort of behave in a believable, realistic manner uh, in the eyes of people? So in some ways, it was basically asking, do they pass the behavior of Turing test? Um, what you're seeing here, uh, you're seeing a few things. So the main thing that we wanted to do was we wanted to create the full architecture, the full generative agents architecture that you uh, would see uh, in our paper. And then this figure basically shows uh, the believability score for not just the full architecture, but also the no reflection or basically ablation conditions. So the full architecture had, I would say, three main components aside from its memory. One is called reflection, the other is called planning, the other is called observation. And we're trying to take each of them away from the main architecture to see how much of the performance drops. Right. So this is a fairly typical ablation conditions where you're trying to see whether each of the components you're adding into this architecture is really helping out the performance of the agents in terms of making it look believable. And then you sort of see the last bar there, that's the human crowd workers. So traditionally in games and beyond games, the way we used to simulate quote unquote human behavior in these contexts was actually by hard coding a lot of these behaviors. And oftentimes that was done by human workers or human authors coming in and saying, this is a reasonable behavior in this context. So we'll have the agent behave that way. So that's basically what we've done here. We basically had human crowd workers come in, actually sort of live a play through two days of the agent's life. So they would actually watch the full live stream of the agent's life in the game. And they would pretend to be these agents as they're interacting, for instance, in this case, with the human evaluators. So that's the condition. Basically, what you're seeing here in particular is these are the what we call 
uh, basically a generalizable version of the ELO scores. So if you're familiar with how chess players get rated, um, mm -hmm. they get rated on this pairwise comparison, right? So player A beats player B, player B beats player C, and so forth. And they get scores based on how many times they win within sort of this uh, pairwise comparisons. Um, we basically calculated a generalizable, generalizable version of that, and that's called true scale rating, which is what you see in the, the x-axis. But except uh, in this instance, we basically can imagine this space being a five-player game between the full architecture ablations and human trial workers. And we're trying to see in this uh, five-player game where we're trying to basically determine who comes out to be most believable according to humans, uh, we're trying to see which one ends up winning the most. And what we basically mm -hmm. find is that the full agent architecture comes out to be most believable or human evaluators, when they look at these responses, they think the responses that are being generated by full architecture is the most believable amongst the five. And why is that more? Why and why is that more? I'm surprised that it would be higher than even human crowd workers. Like, was because they weren't right. good at playing the game, or what you're thinking around that? Yeah. So this is a really interesting uh, element here, where as as Andrew is mentioning, right, that this is quite quite a bit more significant than even human crowd workers. Now, there's a few aspects to this. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that, let's say, a generative version of myself is more believable than June Park. That's not the message here. Uh, in part because pretend, so human crowd workers are basically authoring the behavior of an agent that they saw on the Smallville screen. And it turns out that people role playing as somebody else, that's not an easy task, right? Because you need to take into consideration all the social relationships and context that has happened in the game. And then you need to be creative to come up with reasonable responses. So that's hard. Uh, so that's why sort of, if you look at this chart, Human crowd workers is now sort of the performing the best, right? But this, in some ways, so this is an interesting baseline, right? So what is the baseline we ultimately want to hit? It is, I don't think these agents are more believable than humans themselves in their own lives. That I don't think is happening. What this is saying is that this is more believable than humans role playing as somebody else. And we thought that was a quite an interesting baseline in part because that's what we do today, right? Um, to, that, and that's actually really, that's actually more interesting to as a game developer than I even thought, right? Because this is deeper in the paper and it's like the less exciting part that people didn't talk about. But yeah, I, I will say that like, for example, with Madison, like when she speaks, I don't think I could necessarily do a better job speaking like a Valley girl than she does, to be frank. Um, right. I could, I, I've gotten better at it though, because I've seen it so much. And where I really noticed it was we, we did a, a test with uh, Trump where we made a Trump character. And once I had seen enough Trumpisms, then I felt like I could talk like Trump now finally, whereas before I wouldn't have known how to. So that's that's really interesting. Um, well, this kind of speaks to one of the things that we were observing. There's this genre of gameplay um, called RP, not like RPG in the traditional like rolling dice and Dungeons and Dragons sense, but in a more uh, modern sense, like we see these RP servers uh, for GTA Online, or we see it very commonly on uh, Roblox, where the whole point of the game are pe people are coming together and they're pretending to be a character in this in this world and and living out you know emergent narrative stories together in that way. And right. one of the things that we talked about very often is like, yeah, for the people that are into that, that it's really cool and it's really fun for them, but it hasn't really grown. It hasn't really exploded in the way that other game genres have. And one of the things, at least my personal theory beyond it, uh, behind it, is that it's hard. It's it's it takes a skill. It takes a talent to be able to pretend to be somebody. And so there are a, a subset of people that love doing that, and they end up being very entertaining to watch, like GTA Online. Uh, the RP servers, they have like these live streams on Twitch that, that millions of people watch. Uh, but that's because you're watching people who are good at it. So what about for the rest of the people who aren't good at it? So it, it's interesting to me that you can now have those sort of RP experiences potentially even better, you know, with agents that are behaving in a more believable way in character than what a human could be. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, and, and another thing you mentioned, I just wanted to touch on really briefly was that you know the the agents in, in Smallville basically passed the Turing test, and I, I personally, just on a personal note, I think it's funny where every time AI does something, we're just like, oh, it's not that hard, right? And it was like 
before it was like Turing test. That was the thing. And and you were basically saying this, this shows you built something that passes the Turing test in some sense. And, but it's like, no, nobody seemed to even care or even mention it. And I just find that funny. And, and I don't know, a any thoughts on that? Yeah, so I mean, this is this is an interesting element, right? I, I feel like this is this has been a uh, conversation recently too in sort of the broader Lars Lynch model and these generative AI space, where it's we always thought for some decades the Turing test was going to be the final test that we would have to pass, uh, and it really just went by, and we just look back and people are now sort of thinking, wait, did we just pass it? <laughs> and you know, there's some some people are still. Or I I do think there are some genuine questions as to like what is Turing test, like that we actually pass, like what what's its exact definition. But I do think almost everyone would agree that something did happen, and at least some definition of Turing test we are passing with a flying score. And yeah, it's 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 interesting how like a year ago or even well maybe like two three years ago even uh, a Turing test like passing that would have been like the dream. But now it's like, I think we may have just passed it. Um, I, I think it does speak for a few things, though. One, I, I, ultimately one, I think, is we made an incredible amount, amount of progress, I think much faster than what many of us would have expected. I do think there's another element here, though, where, like, what does it mean to really evaluate these AI systems and agents? I think it's becoming a more interesting question because ultimately appearing to be human may have been easier than we had expected because all we sort of have to do is appear reasonable in the moment, right? So as long as I don't say anything too crazy and remain maybe a little bit safe in terms of what I venture into and so forth, maybe it was fairly doable for these agents to appear human as long as they can sort of master the natural language generation to some extent. And I think that's what we're seeing today. And that's where maybe the next line of evaluation, perhaps that's going to be much more challenging, but maybe more fulfilling and interesting is can we really create complex personas out of these agents or really have them do complex behaviors? Some people are obviously going in the direction of giving these agents tools uh, and ability to do science and math. That's where a lot of sort of, like I say, half of the community's focus is in. I think there's going to be a lot of interesting work that's going to come out from that. Another line of work is sort of what we're discussing here, where what is this idea of simulation? How do we really create simulation that has not just the facade of reality, but is actually rich and has a lot of depth into it and, you know, actually accurate, fun, uh, interesting, and so forth. And I think that's going to be an interesting area going forward. And that's going to be much harder. I don't think we can solve that anytime soon. But I think that's why it makes that space. Like that's why I think that space is even more interesting because it's hard. Yeah, yeah. No, there's a lot to unpack there, and I think I I, I expect that you know with, with even with what we have now in, in in our on our platform for the average player, they like if, like one game that I'm gonna I want us to make or like one uh, experience type will be a Turing test game where you go into a room and you do an activity with a handful of agents and or people. And then you right. have to, it's like, like among us for guess who's the AI. Um, I think that's going to be fun. And I think that's going to be a really great way for us to evaluate the quality of our agents as we develop the system out more. Um, but I think that we will be able to pass that at a sur superficial level, probably already even today. And I think the harder part will be if you try to go to a deeper level, like let's say that you, you know, become very good friends with an AI agent in the game and you start to have a very long conversational history, it might be harder, but I mean, I don't know, like I've been reading a lot of uh, like books and podcasts on like consciousness and how, how to like create good characters. Like we're looking a lot at storytelling and, and AI and psychology. And I think with like some relatively kind of compl complicated, but honestly not super complicated, with the right kind of setup, I think we can even have believable long-term um, relationships with people um, and, and people wouldn't be able to tell theoretically. So I'm, I'm really excited to see, you know, where we go. Cause for us, we don't have to have, like, it doesn't have to be reality. It just needs to be fun enough to make the game great. And I think we're like already quite close. Um, I agree. Um, I'm kind of curious, you know, um, where you see the next, step 
uh, to be in this whole, um, you know, autonomous, believable, uh, you know, uh, accurate agent saga. You know, okay. uh, one of the things that I, I think has been interesting for us as we've been developing this is kind of learning the limitations of uh, language models, what they can and can't do, um, and how much, you know, you need to rely on traditional simulations uh, in order to, to get some of that back. Uh, yeah. One of the more recent realizations that I had personally is this idea of this, you know, oh, if we only had more context window, we could do more is not necessarily a true statement. You know, like uh, their ability to reason about a larger and larger context uh, sizes uh, diminishes as well. Uh, so it's, you know, context is not the solution to all problems. I'm kind of curious, you know, like thinking ahead, what, you know, what do you think is the next phase of of bringing about these these agents as we are, you know, envisioning them. Right. Let's see. So there are some technical thoughts, and also there's also like application domains thoughts. And I can briefly touch on both. Uh, so more technically speaking, right? At the context window, I think this is an interesting question, right? The context window has increased a lot. Uh, you know, I think we can definitely give the large language model community credit for that. Like, I'm impressed that if Somebody had told me that we would have like over 100k context uh, window for OpenAI's you know, ChatGPT like to this year. I would have been surprised last year if I heard that. So that's fantastic. That's impressive. I do think uh, if you really want to have, but you, you, we, we humans likely we like accrue memories that's way over 100k tokens per day. Right? So I do think that limitation will continue to be the case. And really trying to solve that over the long run, I think it's going to be a really interesting space. So that might have to do with creating better retrieval model, right? So you have a huge context uh, that you store in the long-term memory. How do you know which one you really need to pull out from it? Um, that's that's an interesting space for sure. Uh, I think there will continue to be interesting research going on in that area. I also do think uh, with this agent space. There's going to be an interesting space that's going to emerge in the next year or so where we try to combine something like generative agents, like large language model based agents, with existing paradigms that uh, already existed with building agents. Um, so that might some, be something like large, uh, reinforcement learning agents, right? So, right now, sort of the paradigm that I am seeing today is a lot of these. Uh, large language model and agent space is trying to either create something that's completely free-handed. So generative agent, we really don't have much control over these agents because they can go and live their own and they do whatever they want to do at the end of the day. Uh, but games, you need much more control over these agents, right? So one thing that I am seeing is a lot of these agents are now being tied with something like behavior trees um, so that they can we can control their generation and behavior a little bit more. I do think a reinforcement learning into this mix, I think it's also going to give us a really interesting story here, where if we can start to envision, you know, reinforcement learning, what they really need is this idea of objective function that they are trying to optimize for. Can we create objective function in natural language uh, so that it gives much more freedom, but also much more control for the developers? So, you know, we can even think about can the objective function not be a mathematical equation, but a statement like make a lot of friends or be happy. I think that's going to be an interesting space. So that's the technical end. Um, I think for the application space, I can say some. My general philosophy here is we. So in my work as well, we presented generative agents and all the simulation space in the context of games, right? Sims, simulation games, and so forth. I do think games are a really interesting space to be in right now. It will continue to be, and I think it's going to be even more important uh, down the line. And a part of the reason why that is the case for me, I actually think is because the definition of games will change, like what it means to be a games company or game product will change. Um, and we certainly have, maybe it's just coincidence that terms overlap, but we even have things like game theory or economic games, right? Mm -hmm. And we don't usually think of them as entertainment games, but they were sort of quote unquote games that had different role in our society and communities. I think that could actually be a bigger part going forward uh, that's much more salient and tangible in our daily lives. So that's what I'm seeing in this space. Yeah, no, that's a great, so much there to unpack. I feel like we could <laughs> go, yeah. go quite a bit.
uh, longer. I can't believe we've, we've already hit uh, the, the, the 45 minute mark here um, with our time. So no, this was really great. We'll definitely have to have you on again, June. Um, you know, we're working and we'll make sure to give you, so what we're doing next, we mentioned the emotion engine. So adding richer emotions. Um, the other thing we're doing that we didn't have time to review today is we actually have a uh, scenario builder where you can actually customize um, for now, it's just you can customize the vampire and change how she speaks. You can turn her into a math teacher. You can, you know, have her speak like with a southern accent. You could have her speak other languages. Um, it's, and it's the idea that story. if you get the if you get the question wrong, she she gets angry and is about to uh, she yeah, drinks her sure. blood. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, that's that would that's probably what would happen. Um, and and so that's what we're going to be doing in in the next like two weeks or so. That's going to release. And then we're going to let you actually change how the character looks. And then it's going to be adding multiple characters, changing how the room looks. So you can make a, I really want to do one, a boardroom where you're pitching a VC, your startup, and then uh, they will invest or not invest. And we could do vampire edition or just standard um, edition so that we're going to be able to right. do a, a lot of really cool stuff. So um, how can people, what's the best way for people to kind of stay in touch with you and your work? Is it, is it Twitter or um, somewhere else? Yeah, Twitter's fantastic. I, I do check. I don't post a lot, but I certainly do check my Twitter space. Uh, so um, yeah, Twitter, or if you just type my name, there's also going to be my website and with all my contact information. Okay, awesome. That that's great. And you know, for on, on our side, like you know, we're doing uh, it right now. It's closed alpha, so we're just kind of working with a select group of streamers for them to make videos, kind of get the word out. Um, and you know, hopefully, we'll go into an open beta. At some point next year but for anyone who's watching uh vampire.inside.dev you can register um check it out if you're a streamer we'd love to chat if you're if you're not either way like we're happy to have people join get into our discord and start to you know give access to more people um as we go so thanks so much for your time june and ha have a great day you too. See you thanks later, for having me yep thanks june bye